I have a concept I call constructive doubt. Now, constructive doubt is essentially when you're challenging the belief of another, but doing it in such a way where they're actually challenging their own beliefs. Need to be a little gentle here. Need to be a little careful. You don't want to say, well, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard, or you're wrong, I'm right. What you want to do is take almost a Socratic approach. What I mean is, is that you want to ask them questions, which they feel initially, oh, of course I know the answer to that, until they come back and say, uh, can you rephrase the question? Sure. You rephrase it, and you finally get to a, I'm not really sure, or I don't know, or why is that important? or something along those lines. The problem we have when we actually get someone on the phone that agrees to talk to us is we do all the talking. We're going to get them on the phone. We've got 60 seconds. We're going to make our pitch. Yada, 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 blah, 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 this, that, and the other thing. And the person on the other phone is going, Jesus, what do I, I got to get, get out of here. What do I do? And you pause, probably because you need to breathe, at which point you hear, I'm not interested, bang. We take a slightly different approach than what we normally do. What do we do? We get on the phone, we describe our value proposition. We talk about what our belief structure is. We talk about what a great person we are. We talk about how great our firm is. In fact, we do all the talking. My goal when I get someone on the phone is not to give information. My goal is to get information. Because without information, I have no idea whether or not I can even help that person. Or if that person's somebody, I want to get to know more. Now, what most people do, you need to ask questions of that prospect. Well, guess what? That prospect doesn't want to disclose how much he's worth. They don't want to disclose where their accounts are held. They don't want to send you the statements. Are you an investor? Yes or no? What do you think about the market here? I don't know. Do you buy stocks? Yes. Why? I mean, it's ludicrous to hear it literally, you might as well get there and just pull your own hair out because that's what some of these calls sound like. On the other end of the phone, I've been cold called by some of the smoothest cold callers you can imagine. And essentially, I call them out on the book or website they went to to learn that technique. And usually we end up having kind of a funny conversation. But I've never bought anything off a cold call, ever. I don't think I ever would, or a cold solicitation. I need to know if I'm the prospective client, you're worth my time. And if you're not, why do I want to give you any information at all? A lot of people spend a good amount of time basically just talking about how great their firm is. Well, that's fine. I'm sure you work for a great firm. I'm sure that your research is awesome. I'm certain that over the course of that call, that prospective client couldn't give a shit what you're saying. All they want to do is get off the phone. So why don't we take it a slightly different way? Why don't we ask questions that might actually give that prospective client pause? Here's one. Mr. Prospect, Mrs. Prospect, terribly sorry to interrupt your day. This call may be very, very short, which you may be happy with, or it may lead to us getting to know one another. May I ask you one question? Okay, what is it? When you look at your investment performance, what do you compare it to? Now, that's a loaded question. Think about this for a second. If they say, we don't have investment performance because we have no money, hey, thanks for your time anyway let you go. What they'll probably say is they'll name some index or they'll name something that they heard somebody made somewhere that they feel they should do as well in their investment performance as well. What they're doing is they're using a subjective measurement. has no bearing on the outcome of their life because they haven't determined yet the next question, what the annual return on investment is that they need to achieve all of their goals? That's your second loaded question. Now, if you're talking to someone who just invests because they want to make money, they have absolutely no goals in mind other than to make money, and they have no idea how much money they need to make, you've got a real prospect on the line. 
because these are the answers people seek. And very few advisors spend the time to determine what that is. Now, they may go to their advisor, their own advisor somewhere. When you ask them this question, can you correlate what you currently hold in whatever method you hold it, whether you're self-directed or you've got an outside advisor, can you correlate what you hold to a return on investment that will allow you to get to all of your goals, which, by the way, should have a percentage return that you need to average over some period of time so you can get to where you need to go. Because that's how you control risk. At this point, if they have money, they're talking to you. If they have the answers, by the way, odds are they're dealing with a great FA or, and or someone that I trained or has been trained in this method. Because this method essentially probes for need, not capacity to invest, it probes for need and it poses questions in a way that most advisors don't even think about. Oh, I've got a financial plan from this advisor, blah, blah. It's got this Monte Carlo, this success rate. Who cares? That has nothing whatsoever to do with what we're talking about. Because if the client doesn't know in a dynamic fashion, if they're online to achieve their goals, and there's not a process in place to manage risk, that's someone that needs to have a conversation with you. Another great question. Mr. Endor, or Mrs. Client, what is your advisor's strategy to manage risk? What you'll learn as we go through the A to B process, which mathematically is going to blow your mind, is that we dynamically manage risk to an outcome. Now, risk is a word we see all the time. For people to open a cl- an account with you, what do they do? Well, they have to select a risk profile. I'm conservative. I'm aggressive. I'm this. I'm that. By the way, those risk profiles are not written for you to help the client achieve their goals. They're written so if things go wrong, the client can't blame you. Think for a minute about how risk profiles suffer from what we'll call recency bias. Right now, you've got more people coming into the market that have never been in the market at any point in time, and they're coming in on March. Whenever I start to see the news cover the stock market as a huge news item or what's going on in digital currencies or all the rest of it, I look at it and those are really good stories. Awesome. It's great. It's not different this time. This will end the exact same way all of these things end. The market will run to greed. It will then run back to fear. It will go back to greed. It will go back to fear. Your clients right now, many of them, your prospects especially, that you're talking to, have no idea that in all likelihood, they've allowed their asset allocation in their growth segments, equities, to grow to a point that if they had fresh cash today, they wouldn't reestablish at the same allocation. Think about what I just said. Yet, but for a transaction and possible taxes, They'll continue to allow their risk of uncertainty to increase, even though they may be approaching their goals at a higher rate of speed than they thought, which is the exact time to pull back on the amount of risk that's there. Last one, before you get off the phone. All else fails. Mr. and or Mrs. Prospect, can you define the word risk in seven words or less, and then just go silent. Sit back and enjoy the show because they will tell you how it feels, what it does. It's associated with loss. Usually that comes from the wife. It's associated with what I could have made and didn't. Everybody's talking about what the feeling is of risk. Well, for a word we use all the time, maybe we should figure out the definition. So why don't you take a minute and write down on a piece of paper, no cheating, Your definition of risk, seven words or less. I'll wait. You didn't get it, did you? No peeking. The possibility of loss, damage, or injury. Seven words. That's it. How many of your prospects know that? I'm betting you didn't know it before I just said it. 
yeah, we can describe it like a feeling, like why we like vanilla over chocolate or vice versa. Think about these questions on the right. Think about the quality of the conversations that you can have when you put these questions out there. I'm currently coaching a number of very senior producers, some of whom are doing incredibly well. This set of questions was posed by a financial advisor, I think in his fourth or fifth year. He's doing well. To one of his largest clients, he's a scientist with multiple patents, incredibly wealthy. It was supposed to be a check-in call that was supposed to last five minutes. An hour and a half later, talking about how important this is to know, the client transferred in an additional $7 million, invited this FA to go on his sailboat for some sort of drinking festival with 10 of his buddies up around the New Islands off of Connecticut. And he wants them to come sit in with his investment group because him and all his other inventors who do extremely well are always analyzing new investments. He started with the first question. Guys, this stuff works. In the next module, we're going to start to dig in and get it to work for you. See you soon.